Noticing the stuff that's been flipping by up here about the size of our organization, uh, we're now over 200 member units. Uh, for those of you that did not want to go to Scotland, we uh, we actually had some very nice sunny days occasionally. But saw some, <laughs> but saw some wonderful geology over there, and uh, 20 people really enjoyed the, the time over there. Uh, two weeks and uh, didn't see a lot of people. A lot of geology. And uh, it's all it's very interesting when you start thinking about plate tectonics and how it all fits back together. We would love for you to become a member uh, because there are special things that only members get to do, such as the upcoming barbecue, which will come up here in just a second, that uh, you do not want to miss because our very own district attorney is our chief grill master or pit master or whatever the right term is. But, uh, and it's delightful. But uh, two weeks from today on August 4th, our very own Mike Adler is going to be talking about everything you needed to know about the modern cosmology. And I think his pictures are out in the lobby. And then uh, somebody else's. All right. Well, they're lesser quality then. <laughs> Here's a barbecue uh, on uh, August 8th, but you must be a member of that. Uh, and uh, we're also starting the outcrop of the month, uh, landslides. Why would that be important here? Uh, next Wednesday and then in August, the Huckleberry Ridge Tough with uh, Dave Adams. So lots of good things, lots of good reasons to, to become a member. Uh, the rest of our calendar uh, is out there in the little uh, plastic holder. Grab this. This is the rest of the year. John is probably going to put 2016 on the back here pretty soon. And uh, the second talk in August, uh, our uh, very own uh, Bob Tilling is going to be back in town at that period of time. And he's going to be talking about the Tambora volcano in Indonesia uh, in 1815, which is uh, one of the best documented and the world's largest and deadliest eruption in recorded history. So it should be, and he's a, a great speaker. But we also have an app, oh, one last thing before I go into that. Uh, we couldn't do this without the Library Foundation. We're one of the very few groups that get to schedule months and years in advance, more than once a month, to have these kinds of presentations. Old Bills is coming around. If you do that sort of thing, think about the Library Foundation. Now, We've got a, a, a truly outstanding speaker tonight uh, that John is going to talk about in just a minute. But I would like to introduce a person in our audience that to me is very special. And I'm going to ask uh, Warren Hamilton to please stand up, sir. Uh, Warren actually uh, went to UCLA and he got his PhD in 1951. A few years later than that, I was at UCLA. Just about the time where his writings about plate tectonics and how island arcs and all that worked were beginning to come out. And there was still a huge debate. And I will never forget uh, Preston Cloud, in one of my early classes at UCLA, was poo pooing this idea of plate tectonics. Then in graduate school, I go up to Santa Barbara, well, and behold, Preston Cloud turns up again. And now it's the greatest idea since sliced bread. <laughs> and quite frankly, this gentleman was instrumental in the papers he wrote about really moving it from disbelief to common knowledge. And I want to thank you, and I'm just delighted that you're here. So thank you. Just to give you an idea of what a real world-class geologist is, Warren has uh, worked and published detailed geological mappings and reports in 10 states in the United States. He's done geological papers addressing eight different countries. And he has given, uh, he's published papers on every single continent on the planet except Europe. I don't know why you didn't want to work in Europe. 
I missed it. Okay, he's reading papers on every single continent on Earth and including Venus. So, I mean, this guy has walked it, seen it, talked it, and knows what he's talking about. So I'll sit down and shut up and turn it over to John. Thank you for being here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Tour, Jr., Vice President of the Geologist in Jackson Hole, and it's a real pleasure to have you here this evening. It's an even greater pleasure to have the honor of introducing our speaker this evening, uh, who is Dr. Jillian Folger, Professor of Geophysics, Department of Earth Sciences, Earth Sciences, Durham University. She has degrees in this order from Cambridge, Durham, Cambridge, Durham, that last one being her PhD. She has held um, numerous various uh, professional positions, including with the United States Geological Survey, but has been a professor uh, at Durham University since uh, 2004. She's a member and our fellow of multiple uh, societies, most recently the Geological Society of America has recognized her as a fellow. She's authored uh, over 100 published papers, 150 ab abstracts and conference proceedings. Um, and since uh, over the last uh, 10, 12, 13 years, has delivered over 50 invited lectures in the UK, the USA, Finland, Mexico, and Italy, and here tonight. She has long been involved as an organizer, consultant, committee member of multiple uh, earth science organizations, including NASA, American Geophysical Union, um, and just sort of as an interesting tidbit, she was a consultant on the BBC Super Volcano movie, so she can tell us all about uh, Yellowstone, what they did and didn't do right. Um, she's a recipient of multiple honors and awards, and perhaps most notably, the Royal Astronomical Society's Price Medal in October of 2005. And from the press release, I'll just read that the Price Medal is usually awarded every other year for investigations of outstanding merit in solid earth geophysics, oceanography, or planetary sciences. Professor Gillian Folger's research has raised serious doubts about the nature of the hot spots beneath volcanic centers such as Iceland, Hawaii, and Yellowstone. And that's a great lead in because that's basically what Gillian is going to talk to us tonight about. Um, and I will mention it now, and I will try to remember to mention it at the end. If you're interested in her book and or a very special coffee mug, she has uh, some of those uh, uh, at a very special price over here. <laughs> And they are special because uh, my wife bought me uh, her, her book um, about three Christmases ago and paid full freight. And I can tell you it was at least three times so what Jillian's offering it for her tonight. So without further ado, a great pleasure. I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Jillian Folger. indeed, uh, John, for that uh, very handsome and uh, completely undeserved, I'm sure, um, introduction. Um, can everybody hear me about right? Is this uh, volume about right? Yeah. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the Georges of Jackson Hole, and very sincerely for inviting me here to uh, speak to you. Um, it's always a great pleasure to speak to people um, who are truly interested in the subject, and, uh, and uh, I just enjoy sharing my work with uh, whoever is interested in listening. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank um, Irene Beardsley and Dan Bloomberg for putting up uh, me and uh, my uh, party, which uh, is, uh, includes Warren Hamilton and uh, Bruce Julian at the back there, a uh, seismologist from the USGS who's filming this uh, lecture. And I'd also like to thank uh, um, the, the, the Wilcox and the Hepburgers who are going to put us up for the second part of our visit. So uh, the uh, hospitality of Jackson Hole is uh, second to none, I think. So let's get straight on with the uh, lecture, and I'm going to divide the lecture into two parts. I'm going to first talk about the plume hypothesis, and I'm going to explain why my colleagues and I are not persuaded by the plume hypothesis, and uh, why we think that uh, it, it doesn't do to explain uh, anomalous volcanism. And I'm going to devote the second half of the talk to explaining what the alternative, the plate hypothesis is. I'm going to um, show a few slides of uh, this region, Yellowstone and uh, the Basin Range Province, but I'm not going to focus on that because I'm going to talk solely about the Yellowstone Province uh, tomorrow in my talk tomorrow morning. 
So um, let's start off uh, by talking about the Plume Hypothesis. And uh, this all started in 1971 by a gentleman called uh, Jason Morgan, who proposed that uh, volcanism, which could not easily be explained by plate tectonics, was explained by mantle plumes. So this came shortly after the acceptance of uh, plate tectonics, uh, to which Warren made a profound contribution. And when people accepted plate tectonics, they suddenly realized that it explained almost all the volcanism on Earth. The Pacific Ring of Fire, island arcs, and volcanism in Iceland, and along the ridges down the centers of the oceans, these were all occurring at plate boundaries. But there was one huge elephant in the living room, and that was Hawaii. Hawaii is <coughs> smack in the very middle of the biggest plate on Earth. This is all the Pacific plate here. Uh, this part over here. So it's right in the very center. It's a very vigorous volcano, as we all know, and it's just about as far from a plate boundary as you could possibly get. So what was this? And people first started off by suggesting that the Pacific plate, which everybody realized was now moving, was moving over a hot region in the mantle. It was suggested that the mantle that was feeding volcanism was at a particularly high temperature there, and this was causing extra melt to be produced. So the term hot spot refers to the mantle. The term hot spot does not refer to volcanism on the surface. If, if that was the case, then all of the subduction zone volcanoes and the cascades, they would all be hot spots. So hot spot does not mean an active volcano. It means that the mantle source, some tens of kilometers deep in the earth, is warmer than it is in other regions. However, in 1971, as I say, Jason Morgan came along and he said, it's not just Hawaii, there are approximately 20 places which are like Hawaii. He said that they're all fixed relative to one another, so he envisaged um, a situation like this where you had these rising diapairs and the plates were moving every which way across them and carrying away chains of uh, volcanoes. And uh, Jason said that if we date these volcanic chains, then all of these volcanic loci on the different plates would be fixed relative to one another. So the question is, by this time, scientists knew that the upper mantle was convecting vigorously. So how could these things be fixed and not just moving with the, the uh, convection in the upper mantle? Well, Jason said they could be fixed because they were rooted below the convecting mantle. They were rooted in the deep mantle. And uh, this was rapidly associated with the core mantle boundary, which is 3,000 kilometers deep in the Earth. So this is what Jason envisaged. Um, this is the hot core. The Earth's core is approximately 1,000 degrees centigrade hotter than the mantle above. And Jason envisaged that this hot core was heating up patches of the mantle just above it, and that thermal diapairs were rising up like this kind of stem here. When they reach the base of the lithosphere, which is hard and brittle and, and does not convect, then this, this big bulbous head would spread out uh, in, in a kind of pancake. So I'm briefly going to say what the alternative is, just to get the two out uh, together here. The alternative is that um, anomalous volcanoes like Hawaii and Iceland and, and Tristan de Cunha and Yellowstone are not fed by hot diapirs from 3,000 kilometers down in the, in the Earth's mantle. But instead, the mantle contains pervasive melt, and the volcanism occurs where the lithosphere goes into extension, for example, the Basin Range province. The lithosphere is torn apart, and it just allows melt to leak passively up to the surface. So this is a top-down hypothesis that is focused on the lithosphere being the active member, and the deep mantle down here has got nothing to do with it. So we should, when we're doing any science, whether we're developing drugs or, uh, sorry, medications, excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> or, or whether we're uh, doing geology or anything else, we should address our science in a scientific way. And what that means is that we should be postulating uh, hypotheses, we should say what the predictions of these hypotheses are, and then we should go and test the, the, the predictions. So for example, if we were 
developing a medication to cure cancer. We would develop our medication, we would say, you know, we think this will cure cancer, and um, obviously it would then be tested in various ways to see if in fact it did cure cancer. Nobody would take this medication unless, you know, it had been tested and it had been shown to actually do the job. So this is the scientific method. And if we're going to test the plume hypothesis, this excellent hypothesis which Jason proposed, then we should say what its predictions are and we should go out to volcanic areas and we should test them. So, um, in recent years I've worked with um, uh, colleagues, including colleagues who uh, prefer the plume hypothesis, and at one point I said to them, look, you've got to tell us what the predictions are so that we can address that. Please do that. And uh, a, an obliging colleague, uh, Professor Campbell, who uh, works in Australia, he wrote a couple of papers where he clearly laid out what are the predictions, and there are five of them. So the first prediction is that when this hot diapere rises up and it impinges on the base of the lithosphere, that it domes the lithosphere up. So we have a big doming, which is maybe a 1,000 kilometers in diameter, and it has an amplitude of one or two kilometers. This occurs before any volcanism takes place, but after this updoming, the lithosphere bursts open and floods of volcanism occur. So we have the North Atlantic Volcanic Province, the Columbia River basalts, <coughs> Hawaii, Paraná basalts, Siberian traps, etc., etc. The, the famous Deccan traps, which uh, some people think uh, caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that's the second thing that should happen. The third prediction is that we should see this. Um, this, this mushroom stem, this, this plume tail going down to the core mountain boundary. You should be able to see this, for example, using seismic tomography. The fourth prediction is that we should see a regular time progressive trail of volcanism behind the currently active locus. So here we have Hawaii, and the islands should get older and older as you go back along the chain. And the fifth hypothesis is that the mantle should have a temperature which is higher than we see elsewhere, for example, at mid-ocean ridges. So these are the five predictions. Uplift, flood volcanism, a plume tail, high temperature, and time progressive trail. <coughs> However, my colleagues and I are persuaded that these predictions are not confirmed. And uh, I invite anybody who is interested in the audience to take any so-called hotspot of their choice and just to dredge through the literature and see if they can satisfy themselves about these five hypotheses. Um, precursory uplift is not seen. I just have uh, time to uh, go over just a small number of these uh, failures of predictions, if you like. Um, it's a big subject. But precursory uplift is not observed anywhere. Um, here I would introduce you to two gentlemen, uh, both of whom are uh, counted my friends. Uh, this is Professor Ian Campbell of the Australian National University, who is a strong plume advocate and has uh, worked on plumes throughout his life. And uh, this uh, gentleman here is Dr. Scott Bryan, who works at the University of Queensland. And uh, both of these two gentlemen have worked on the subject of uplift. And Professor Campbell is the one who wrote these papers laying out the predictions. And uh, Professor Campbell has told me that in his view, it's this precursory uplift which is the, the smoking gun for a mantle plume. That is the particular prediction that he hangs his hat on. And uh, this is an excerpt from one of his papers where he's written, the arrival of a hot plume head in the upper mantle will produce domal uplift at the surface, the magnitude of which depends on its average temperature. The area of maximum uplift is predicted to have a radius of CA 200 kilometers and to be surrounded by a zone with radius CA 400 kilometers. Then he goes on to say the best documented example of domal uplift occurs in association with the Emission Flood Basalt Province in China. So um, this was published in several papers and uh, my colleagues and I were sort of quite disquieted about this because uh, from the uh, papers that were were published, it looked as though there was very strong evidence for exactly this phenomenon. So we became very interested in this, and for a while we didn't have an answer to this until um, uh, Dr. Scott Bryan actually went on a field trip there. 
And uh, he and his colleague, um, Abstin's Pete, um, apparently they went to the up outcrop of the rocks below the Amitian flood basalts. So if you want to look for precursory uplift, you have to look at the rock layers below the flood basalt, and you have to see some evidence that uplift occurred in those rock layers. And they went to see these rock layers, and Scott Bryan told me afterwards that it took him about 30 seconds to realize that these rocks were not carbonates, as had been uh, advertised, but they were phreatomagmatic deposits, and they were part of the flood basalts. So in fact, um, this uh, claim was completely without foundation because some of these rocks had been misidentified. And anyways, there was then quite a vigorous to and fro in the, um, in the, the literature where um, Professor Campbell replied to this, and, and this was answered, and so on and so forth. And uh, these two kind of um, got quite excited about this, and they started looking at other regions, and they published, in summary, only the Amisham is claimed to show a kilometer scale transient dome, domal uplift out of the 77 large igneous provinces known since the Archean. However, the Amisham volcano stratigraphy invalidates this claim. So what they're saying here is, not only is the claim invalidated for the Amisham flood basalts, which the Plume people considered the strongest case, but you don't see uplift underneath any of them at all. So time progressive volcano chains, as I say, I've just got time to touch upon um, a small number of um, the most egregious mismatches, which uh, we think are important. And here we're looking at uh, Hawaii. So Hawaii has got a beautiful time progressive chain. Of course, the active uh, end of it here is uh, zero million years. The, the, the so-called Big Bend is 50 million years. And uh, the, the oldest end is 80 million years. And they get gradually older and older as you go along the chain. And uh, for many years, most of us, not Warren, but <laughs> us uh, mere mortals, we assumed that you know this was obviously a mantle plume, and uh, I myself taught my own undergraduates that this big bend here occurred because the Pacific plate had changed the direction over a fixed mantle plume. I taught this myself. <laughs> However, you know this was an assumption. I had read this in the literature, and I assumed it must be true. But some people didn't assume it was true, and they actually calculated where the Hawaiian emperor chain should lie if it were caused by a fixed plume. And uh, this is the calculation that they made. And this has been done by multiple authors using different methods. If Hawaii was caused by a fixed mantle plume, then this is what the chain would look like, and it would not look like this. And the Pacific plate did not change direction at about 50 million years, so you can see there's a little teensy-weensy kink here, but there is certainly not a big bend, because everything we know about the uh, holistic plate motions and the tectonic plates on the surface of the Earth tell us that the Pacific plate did not change direction at 50 million years, and it certainly did not um, move by this amount. So, seismology looking for plume tails. Um, I'm an earthquake seismology, seismologist primarily, so um, I've actually done experiments like this. And this is what we do. We go to uh, some location like Yellowstone, for example, and we put a lot of sensors out on the surface. We might put out an array that's 500 kilometers broad or even 1,000 kilometers broad, and we let the sensors record earthquakes which have occurred on the other side of the planet and the waves have gone through the center of the Earth and they're coming steeply up underneath our seismic ray. So uh, these lines represent seismic rays coming up from earthquakes in, in the Chile Trench and uh, Tonga and uh, places like that. And they're actually passing through the material underneath the volcanic region so we can draw some sort of image of uh, what goes on down there. So um, here's just one... Uh, example of a piece of work that's been done um, from Hawaii. So um, here we have a position which is northwest of Hawaii, and this is southeast of Hawaii. So this section has gone along the Hawaiian chain, and Hawaii is in the middle here. And uh, this is the same, just from a different paper. 
Under these two papers were published, this one in 2008 and this one in 2009. And as you can see, this one has imaged a feature which the authors declared was the Hawaiian plume, and it's tilting back up to the northwest under the island chain. And this one has imaged one tilting down to the southeast, in the, the exact opposite direction. And basically, neither of these are resolved. Um, and you can see here that if, if you've got a feature which is in this part of your image, you've just got rays coming up like this. If you see that your seismic rays are delayed when they reach the surface, you can say, oh, well, they've passed through some low wave speed material. That could be a mantle plume, for example. But you cannot tell where along the ray that delay has occurred. So there's a lot of ambiguity in seismic tomography, and you cannot believe all the colored pictures that you are shown. Um, one, one of the co-authors on this paper is actually a good friend of mine and a, a very good uh, seismologist and um, I confronted him with this at an AGU meeting a couple of years ago and I said, uh, how do you explain this? And he said, neither of these models is resolved. In other words, you can't believe this or this. So I said, well, why are you publishing this stuff if it's not resolved? <laughs> Um, here, here I've summarized um, four different uh, pieces of uh, work that have been done to identify where the, the Hawaiian plume is. So you can see there's absolutely no repeatability between such subjects, between different studies. And the one point I'm going to emphasize in my talk tomorrow is that um, seismic tomography is much more suspect than we really are comfortable in, in living with. And, um, now we've been practicing this, uh, this subject for many years and uh, we're getting to the point where people are doing repeat experiments at important places like Yellowstone and now we can look at the different studies and instead of just having one study which says you know, blah 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 this is what's under Yellowstone we've got several different studies and we can compare people's results and we're seeing some very uncomfortable things. Okay, so I'm just going to make a couple of uh, points uh, as I wind up before I move on to the plate hypothesis. And uh, another thing that my colleagues and I think is very fishy is that um, we've been studying uh, these volcanic regions for 40 years now, and yet still nobody can agree how many plumes there are or where these plumes are. So um, here I've taken together four different studies done by four different um, research groups. And I've just plotted on the same maps um, the places where they say there are plumes. And uh, you can see in this particular study, there are, these workers thought there were five plumes. And here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven plumes here. And here's another study with uh, three, six, seven, eight plumes. And if you compare them, there's only one place which is common on all of these uh, maps, and that is Hawaii. Every other single proposed plume that some group or other has not uh, advocated it. So, uh, you know, we, 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 th we think this is uh, not a very robust hypothesis. So, just, just to finish up, you know, how, how do people deal with this? If you go to a person who pre prefers the plume hypothesis and you say, look, you don't see X, you know, how can you explain that? Well, they just morph the hypothesis to fit the data. So if you say, well, um, if you say, well, uh, you know, the volcanism's here, but you say the plume is over there, then how can that be? And they say, well, you know, the plume's just, the material has flowed laterally. If you say, well, here we have a volcanic chain, such as the Cameroon volcanic line, and that things are erupting along the whole line all the time, why is that? They say, oh, the plume is a tabular shape. So the hypothesis has just become an unfalsifiable hypothesis. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's no more falsifiable than a teacup orbiting around the sun. Um, <laughs> the plume hypothesis has become so um, liable that it's just a question, if, if you've studied some volcanism somewhere, you're just proposing that there's a, there's a plumbing pipe somewhere which is pumping this volcanism into that area and into the surface. And it's not really a scientific hypothesis which is forward predictive to any other regions, and it's not really adding anything to our understanding of these regions. 
So, I'll now move on to the plate hypothesis. So, as I say, the plate hypothesis suggests that, uh, you know, what's going on in the deep mantle, um, that's uh, not reflected in anything that's happening at the surface. What's going on at the surface is that the tectonic plates, which initially were thought to be just absolutely solid and rigid, like the plates on the back of a tortoise, um, we know that that's not true anymore. We know that they deform internally. And there's probably no place better than here in the Western USA to see how a coherent plate is actually pulling itself apart in the middle and volcanism is occurring in association. And we think that this volcanism is just, as the plate pulls apart, there's meltdown there anywhere for, anyway for various reasons and we think that is just passively leaking up to the surface. So the three predictions of the plate hypothesis is that where you see volcanism of interest, such as Yellowstone, you should see lithospheric extension. We predict that there is melt available in the mantle, dispersed in various different quantities, and we predict that the mantle source, for example, if we imaged it using tomography, we should see that this is restricted to relatively shallow depths in the mantle. It doesn't go down to the core. So, there are many ways in which plates can extend. As I say, we have this uh, remarkable basin range province. Uh, we have back arc spreading. We have spreading plate boundaries. We have continental rift zones. There are quite a lot of different ways in which the plates can pull themselves apart. So, we would expect the melting anomalies that occur in reaction to be quite diverse. And this is, in fact, what we do see. So, here is one map. Uh, from uh, one group, which I showed on the previous slide, showing the places where they think uh, are mantle plumes. And Hawaii, for example, a huge island in the middle of the Pacific with a beautiful time-progressive trail back behind it. Um, here we have Iceland, which is just a massive multi-volcano flood basalt province right on the spreading plate boundary. Uh, we have places like uh, the McDonald's Seamount, which is one relatively small seamount sitting on the bottom of the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we have Easter Island here, which is a rotating microplane. All these places are completely different. Some of them are huge, some of them are very small volcanoes. So um, this, to my mind, we would not expect a one-size-fits-all hypothesis to explain all of these very diverse volcanic regions. So, how can the lithosphere extend and do we see volcanism associated with it? Well, um, here's the first example from my own stomping ground. Uh, Durham is here. If anybody wants to um, have a vacation, we need the money, so the <laughs> euro's in a bad way. <laughs> I don't go to Greece. <laughs> So uh, 54 million years ago, the North Atlantic started to form, and uh, when Eurasia split apart, when, when our, great, our great nations first parted company, and the ocean started up in between, um, then there was a tremendous amount of flood volcanism forming the so-called volcanic margins, which lie off the coast of Greenland and Norway. And uh, this has been suggested that this is due to a mantle plume, However, I would suggest to you that if you take a supercontinent with a lithosphere 200 kilometers thick and you crack that and you tear the two sides apart, then obviously a sthenosphere, a um, convecting mantle, is going to rise up from beneath. It's going to rise through 200 kilometers. It's going to decompress and melt, and you would expect to see a lot of volcanism. And this has been modeled by Van Wick and colleagues and uh, she did a numerical finite element analysis here, a model where she actually split, split the continent. So here is the unsplit continent, the blue is the lithosphere. Then she started off by stretching it, and the convecting mantle rises up underneath. And finally, when the two sides part, then you get a large amount of volcanism. And people have modeled this, and they've found that you can, you can um, model the thickness of these lavas, which is about 25 kilometers just with passive upwelling from splitting the lithosphere. So I, I put it to you that if a supercontinent breaks up in this way, and you have volcanism occurring at the same time, 
that it's more likely that the volcanism results from the lithosphere breaking up than coincidentally a mantle plume smacking up from the core mantle boundary. So, if you don't like rainy Scotland, you can go to Ireland and <laughs> see some of these things. Okay, um, looking at Iceland, um, here we have a bit of seismic tomography where we have looked at this uh, North Atlantic uh, province using seismic tomography. Um, this is a whole mantle tomography cross section. So here we have the surface of the Earth, and uh, this line here shows the line of section. It goes through Iceland in the middle. Okay, so Iceland is here. Um, this dashed line here is at 650 kilometers depth, and that is the base of the upper mantle. So um, my colleagues and I who um, advocate the plate hypothesis, um, we propose that convection goes on in the upper mantle, and that there's essentially no convection in the lower mantle, which is linked to surface tectonics. So we do not deny that convection is going on in the lower mantle, but we think there's very little, perhaps no connection uh, between material moving around in the lower mantle and the rising up to the surface. So this is the surface of the core here. So this is 3,000 kilometers, and this is 650 kilometers. And as you can see in this tomography cross-section, here we're looking at low wave speed of material, which would be what you would expect to see associated with a mantle plume, hot, melt, and you can see that it just goes down to the base of the upper mantle. It does not go any further. And uh, we've done many experiments um, in, in Iceland. And I personally conducted an experiment which uh, consumed about six years of my life, covering the whole country with seismic recorders so that we could image what was underneath Iceland. And uh, we found that the anomaly under Iceland went down to 650 kilometers and no deeper. And we put all our data online, and other people have done similar experiments, and many uh, groups have taken our data and analyzed it with even more sophisticated methods than we used. And everybody finds the same result, that this anomaly goes down to the base of the upper mantle and it stops at 650 kilometers. Back up extension. Oh, I've lost the slide skip over that one. Um, rift valleys, so uh, here we have uh, Europe, and uh, Europe is a back arc um, region. So uh, we have um, the alpine zone here, which is a subduction zone, so um, uh, Africa floated north, it crashed into Europe, the Alps were thrust up, and behind the Alps we have various extensional regions and volcanism. So these red zones here are rift valleys. This is the Rhine Graben. And the green are volcanics. So there are two ways in which we can explain these volcanics. We can either explain these European volcanics as uh, being associated with the rift zones of Europe. This is the Vogelsberg. This is the Eiffelfield. Or we could uh, interpret them as mantle plumes. And uh, an Italian colleague of mine put together this slide where he's he marked on it all the plumes that have been proposed for Europe. So um, he's particularly incensed because there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six plumes proposed to underlie Italy. Um, so I, I think the, the message is that the plume hypothesis has in some sense got completely out of control. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You know, it makes a lot of sense as, as a theory for a few places like Hawaii, for example. There's every reason we should test that hypothesis there. It's got a lot going for it, but it's just got completely out of control so that um, everywhere you see the tiniest volcanic field, people have proposed plumes. And I think uh, one thing which probably everybody has taken on board, um, even people who prefer the plume hypothesis, I think everybody agrees that um, you know, there's been a ridiculous proliferation recent years. Okay, so um, the Basin and Range province, and uh, here is the uh, Eastern Snake River Plain, and of course Yellowstone is off up here. So this is an extending region, and uh, there's a lot of volcanism of course, and the question is how is this extending and along what zones? Um, here we have a map of late Cenozoic uh, volcanic centers, and uh, 
it produces a very interesting pattern. So we have a sort of a three-pronged fork pattern. Here we have the Baez volcanic zone, the St. George volcanic zone, and of course the Eastern State River Plain Yellowstone volcanic zone. And uh, I was struck um, by the similarity to this seismic tomography picture. So um, this was uh, um, this is a very new picture that's been produced, and this shows the structure at a depth of 100 kilometers. This is 300 kilometers, and this is 500 kilometers. And uh, this uh, result was produced using a huge network called US Array, which covers the entire um, United States. I'll be talking about this again tomorrow. But it's interesting to know that at 100 kilometers, we have again got this three-pronged um, pattern, which matches the um, late Cenozoic volcanism. But as you move down to the deeper layers, 300 kilometers and 500 kilometers, then uh, the picture disappears. So to me, this is uh, evidence that these volcanic zones here are associated with uh, um, structures in the mantle down 100 kilometers, maybe 200 kilometers, but um, not any deeper than that. And uh, while, while we're at it, of course, uh, Yellowstone is at this point here, and uh, if you trace this down here, you see the tiny red thing here, but when you get down here, there's no red thing at all. And, um, uh, I shall be proposing tomorrow in my talk that uh, if you take seismic tomography as a whole and look at the many analyses of Yellowstone that have been done, um, the weight of evidence is not in favor of a mantle plume of any kind. Here we have uh, one of these um, whole mantle tomography pictures. So we have a cross section here across the Pacific through Yellowstone <coughs> and uh, on uh, through, this one seems to go more or less through Iceland. So here's Yellowstone. Here we have the North American craton. So we have uh, fast wave speeds, fast seismic wave speeds associated with the, the old cold North American craton. We have low wave speeds associated with the hot Basin and Range province, and here is the Iceland anomaly. And again, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. And I, I don't think any any seismologist um, on Earth at this point in time would argue that there's a plume under Yellowstone that goes down to the core of the boundary. Uh, okay, um, I think this is my last example of how plates can extend. So. Um, here we're at Samoa, and uh, New Zealand is uh, down here somewhere. So here we have a subduction zone. So this is the Pacific Plate, and it's diving underneath the adjacent plate here at this subduction zone. And uh, what we've got here is a very funny uh, plate boundary geometry, where we have a kind of 90 degree bend in the subduction zone. So obviously this is what's happening. This part of the plate is just continuing on its journey up to the northwest, but this part of the plate is diving down the subduction zone. So we've got a sort of bend here, so obviously you must have a tear in this position here. And uh, this is the position where we have Samoa. So again, you can either, uh, so well, you know, I think the most likely reason for this volcanism is, is this tear in the plate, or else you can propose that a plume from the core mantle boundary has coincidentally come up and coincidentally just happens to hit this particular point. I think uh, coincidences do happen, but um, <coughs> you should uh, always question them. So I'm just going to finish off my talk by uh, making a few remarks about melt in the mantle, because that's the second requirement of the plate hypothesis. We require not only extension of the lithosphere, we expect to see shallow structures only, and I'll show you some evidence for that, but we think there is melt in the mantle as well. Um, here we have a uh, graph showing uh, depth in the Earth from zero to 300 kilometers. And here we're showing temperature from 1,000 to 2,000 degrees C. And uh, this field here, this is pyrolite. So this is a uh, mineralogical proxy for mantle material, mantle peridotite. And this line here is the melting point. This is the, the uh, temperature at which the first mineral starts to melt. So this is the so-called solidus. 
when the, the, the most fusible mineral starts to melt, but the whole enchilada is not molten. And uh, this line here shows the so-called liquidus, where the last mineral melts. So if we were to take a sample of mantle material, let's say um, 150 kilometers depth, and if we heated it up, then at this temperature, the first mineral would start to melt. And as we heated it more and more, further minerals would melt. And when we reach this temperature here, the last man mineral would melt and it would be 100% molten. Well, this is the same field for eclogide, which is basically subducted oceanic crust. So we know that oceanic crust goes down subduction zones as a slag. It turns to a, a mineral assemblage known as eclogite when it reaches a certain depth. And it, it's uh, solidus and it's liquidus are at much lower temperatures <coughs> than mantle peridotite. And in a way, this is quite obvious because uh, oceanic crust is formed at spreading plate boundaries. The spreading plate boundary is moving apart like this. Mantle material is upwelling, partially melting, and it's forming new oceanic crust, which is then later going down the subduction zone. But of course, the material that forms the new ocean crust is the stuff that's easiest to melt. So when it goes down the subduction zone, again, again it, will, it will melt before peridotite. So the point of this is that the mantle contains an assemblage of different rock types, some of which will melt at lower temperatures than others. Um, here we're taking a look at the effect of volatiles, carbon dioxide and water um, in, in the mantle. So we all know that when there's a major volcanic eruption, there'll be huge quantities of carbon dioxide and water vapor come out of that eruption. So there's plenty of CO2 and plenty of H2O in the mantle. So um, here we're looking at the melting point of uh, dry rocks. So here we have temperature, and uh, here we have, okay, it's upside down here. This is the surface, and this is 30 kilometers depth. So if we took a dry mantle rock and uh, we, we raised it to different pressures, corresponding to different depths in the mantle, then it would melt, it would begin to melt at <coughs> progressively higher and higher temperature the deeper it went. However, if we fluxed it with CO2, it would melt at a much lower melting point, and if we put excess water in the material, then it would melt at an even lower melting point. So the, the mantle has got volatiles in it. We know that from, because it's erupted a lot of volcanic eruptions, and uh, where there are a lot of volatiles, then you can have melting in a rock which would not otherwise be molten. And here we have another uh, study of volatiles. This is the last technical slide I shall show. So here we're looking at, um, I'm afraid all these axes are different. Here we're looking at pressure from zero down to 10 gigapascals. So this is about 300 kilometers depth. So this is most of the lower mantle. And here again, we're essentially looking at the same thing. Where uh, This is the dry solidus. So if the mantle was dry and didn't have any water and CO2 in it, this is the temperature it would melt. At this particular depth, for example, it would melt at 1,600 degrees. At this depth here, which is about uh, 60 kilometers, it would melt at about 1,300 degrees C. But if it contains carbon dioxide, you see this rather strange behavior of the solidus where as you go down to greater and greater depths in the mantle, the melting point gets higher and higher until you get to about 45 kilometers, and then the melting point suddenly completely collapses at this point here. And then this is probably the asthenosphere. So at this point here, the melting point of mantle material has sort of catastrophically collapsed because of the behavior of carbon dioxide in mantle rocks. So probably when you get, probably this level here is the base of the brittle lithosphere, and below this, there is partial melt in the mantle, and this makes the mantle able to flow, and it's on this material that the plates are floating. So uh, we've got a petrological observation of where the asthenosphere is here, convecting material that the plates ride on. And this uh, matches pretty well seismic observations where we see also a very sharp decrease in the, way, in the speed of seismic waves round about this level here. This is known as the low velocity zone, and it's long been suspected 
um, to contain partial melt. In fact, some people would argue that the seismic low velocity zone can only be explained by partial melt, and uh, this has been equated to the asthenosphere. So, um, that's uh, the, what I've got to show you in the talk, and I'd just like to bring to your attention um, uh, the Mount of Plumes .org website, so if I can get rid of that. Um, Mount of Plumes .org, uh, lives on this computer that I'm using to um, show you the presentation now. So um, if, uh, if I get mugged in the car park, or I'm <laughs> not this stuff, then, uh, that's going to be really bad. <laughs> because we won't have none of plumes that all get involved. But um, I would uh, encourage you all, please, to visit the website. It would be an honor. Um, here along the top, we have various web pages written by different scientists. It's not just me that's produced this, but in fact, um, as I say down here, almost 700 scientists at this point have contributed material to the website, and it's got really huge. And here, uh, let me see now if you're interested in the plume hypothesis. This web page was written by Professor Campbell, who very obligingly engaged with us and laid out um, uh, his, his points. Um, and so let me see here now. Um, uh, plate hypothesis written by myself. And uh, if you're interested in uh, Yellowstone or any other locality, then you can look in the uh, pull-down menu here, and uh, we can see what there is for Yellowstone. And uh, the, the website got so huge, and we had so many um, pieces of work, some of them scholarly, some of them more easily accessible, that um, I had to sort of uh, um, produce these lists here. So several people have written um, web pages uh, on Yellowstone or Hawaii or <clears throat> whatever else you want. Um, we have uh, popular magazine articles here, which are accessible if, if you're not a specialist geologist. Um, we have PowerPoint presentations here if you want to give a lecture of your own. You're very welcome. <laughs> there are thousands and thousands of PowerPoint slides here for all sorts of geological subjects, and you're very welcome to take them and use them um, if you acknowledge the um, uh, authors who have kindly put them up. So um, please have uh, a little visit at that. And PowerPoint back. Uh, that's, uh, that's my talk. <laughs> <laughs> salt on ice. Or, or putting something in hot water that lowers the boiling point and flashes. Well, um, I, I think I'd 
for the salt and ice, sir. <laughs> you, know, you, you, can, you can have a situation where you, you have a broad region of the mantle, it's all at the same temperature, but it will be molten in some places and not in others, just simply because the composition is different. Is there a rifting taking place around the white, or is there another mechanism? Well, this, this, is, this is what the plate hypothesis predicts, but the, the trick is in finding a way to try to measure that, because um, Hawaii is actually quite small. It, it's about 100 kilometers across, whereas Iceland is 450 kilometers across. So Hawaii is quite small, and there's a tremendous lot of magma. The whole area is just completely blanketed with a huge pod of basalt. So how do you get down to the level where you might expect to crack? So um, this has not been tested yet. Do you have an interpretation for the big bend that you described uh, in Hawaii that goes away from? No, no, nobody like, has an explanation for that. Pardon? Uh, correction. <laughs> <laughs> says the mantle of winds oh, yes. blew it there. Well, again, that's a just-so story, isn't it? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't consider it an explanation. If, if you see a phenomenon and you say, oh, the plume must have changed direction, that's not an explanation, that's just an assertion that the plume hypothesis will fit this bed. But um, the, the Hawaiian system is not understood. Uh, there's no flood basalt at the old end, so of course there's no corresponding uplift. There's a beautiful time progressive trail, but um, it's not in the right place. Uh, nobody has imaged a plume out of the core mountain boundary under it, but because it's in the deep ocean, it's not possible to stage the required experiments. And um, there is evidence for high temperature, but then we know that the melt has come from uh, a very large depth, so you'd expect it to be hotter anyway. So the Hawaiian system is just uh, really completely up for grabs, I think. No, nobody can come up with an explanation for it that I consider satisfactory, yes, sir. Well, one possibility is the weight of the volcano is propagating the crack. So you, as the volcano like on a and now becomes heavier and heavier, it's helping to propagate something. So, so, so how, how did that help to propagate the crack, uh, Pete, when the volcanic rate was very low? Just, just after the big bend, uh, it almost fizzled out. The volcanic rate is extremely low, and uh, I can uh, show you that. I think Hawaii is a very exciting place because um, for years people assumed it was all sorted out, and um, I don't think it's sorted out. I think we have to go back to square one. So here, for example, Pete, you know, there's, there's almost nothing here. And, and all of a sudden, in the last uh, two million years or so, the volcanic rate has gone up an order of magnitude. So, you know, you can, this is another puzzle about Hawaii, that uh, it dwindled off to almost nothing here. And then it's got, there was a big pulse here, where the volcanic rate suddenly increased, and these big islands were formed and it tapered off again, and now all of a sudden it's completely gone through the roof. And the volcanic rate, the volcanic production rate at Hawaii at the moment is an order of magnitude bigger than it has ever been in the past. And the age of these eruptions here continue to go back further in time, go around the yes. Could everybody hear that question? Maybe not. Uh, uh, this gentleman was asking if, if the age of the uh, volcanoes becomes greater and greater all the way along the chain, and yes, the answer is it does. It's, it, it's not always at quite the same. The, the propagation rate of the volcanic locus is not always the same, but it's pretty, you know, sometimes it's fast and sometimes it slows down a little bit, but um, it is time progressive along the entire trail. But an important point there, Jill, is that the, the linear change in with <coughs> distance is about the same on both waves. And there is now an enormous amount of uh, paleo latitude work on the emperor half. And the delta latitude delta time does not match the 
uh, yes, that, that's, the, uh, that, volcano that's correct. At the time. So, um, to and, and that's why Carduno had this nutty notion that in four or fifty million years, the wind just blew out. <laughs> I was smoking something, I thought myself. <laughs> um, I mean, to, to, to a first approximation, to a first approximation, um, we have the Pacific plate here, and from, from 80 to 50, that's called the Emperor chain, and, and from 50 to zero, that's the Hawaiian chain. So to a first approximation, from 80 to 50, the volcanic locusts migrated across a stationary Pacific plate. And then at the bend time, at 50 million years, the volcanic locust stopped at its present latitude and the plate started to move. So the only, th the only thing that this lump locust knows about seems to be the plate. For some reason, we're, 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 nobody can get their head around this. We're looking for a mechanism which could cause a, a volcanic locust to want to migrate across the Pacific plate at five centimeters a year, roughly. And if the plate is stationary, the volcanic locust is going to do its own migration. But if the plate starts to move, the volcanic locust will stay put. Well, I, I'm just trying to describe the observations. I mean, who knows what's moving up? You know, when it comes to stuff moving, you always have to say relative to what. So um, what I'm describing here is relative to the geomagnetic pole, which we think has always been approximately located at the spin axis. Let me ask you another question about this display that we have up here. The, what we're seeing in the lighter blue color and dark blue colors are the bathymetric data? Yes. So yes. the depth of the sea now is... Yeah, we're, we're looking at the symmetry here. Yes. Okay, so that's below, so that was... Uh, <laughs> what is the depth Well, um, there's, there's no reason to think that, uh, that when we date the sea floor, what we usually do is to look at um, uh, paleomagnetic epochs. So this is either normal or reversed. And uh, there's an extremely long one where the, the Earth's magnetic pole did not flip, and it stayed the same for many tens of millions of years, and this is known as the Cretaceous Quiet Zone. So it's very difficult to date anything in the Cretaceous quiet zone. And uh, the Emperor Hawaiian chain all lies in the Cretaceous quiet zone. So, you know, if, if there's anybody upstairs there who, who laughs at the human race, then um, I think they put Hawaii there just to give us such a huge challenge. It's almost impossible to crack. From 65 million years ago to 42 million years ago, if that's like you remember, the rate of the Pacific plate was twice what it was after that time. And oh, so yeah. fundamental change in speed. Um, so that doesn't necessarily, I mean. Well, here we have 67 feet, and here we have 61. So this is this is 8 million years step here. And um, here we have, let me see, this would be an 8 million step, 8 million year step here. So well, here. You can go back to my 1991 paper that shows the cross section of the speed. But the speed, as I remember, <coughs> was between 65 and 42, was like 15 centimeters a year. Whereas more now, it's more like six or seven. So, how, how did you calculate that, Pete? Did you assume there was a plume here? And it was no, no, no. It had nothing to do with the plate reconstructions. Okay? And I was just presenting data that other people would copy. I'm not talking here anything, anything specifically about a plume. There was a fundamental change in the direction of the, in the speed of subduction of the Pacific plate under North America from 65 to 42. Well, uh, this, this, this study is from 2000, Pete, and you can see the data here. As I say, this is, this is 8 million years, the distance predicted, and uh, this is about 8 million years too. So I'm not sure if that looks like double to me. Um, I've, I've got another study here that was um, done by uh, another worker looking at the same uh, thing, basically. Let me see if I can find that. 
Here we go. So this was this was done by Tarduno um, in 2009. So this is rather later, and he has used uh, three different plate circuit um, uh, <coughs> databases. This is the red one is one and two and three. So there again. This uh, gentleman here, he was trying every single plate closure circuit he could to see if one of them actually produced a chain such as we observe. And uh, he's got this, some variation here. But, um, so you can see it's all rather similar to, um, I, I don't know if you, this is traveling twice as fast as that. There's a question in the back here too. BJ, you had a problem. If you could go back to that picture you had before, uh, there was a convergence of, at the very, very top, uh, the, the Ember chain uh, trajectory connects with the Lucens and connects with the trench. And yeah, way up at the top there, uh, did something special happen at that time, at that place, and it's the information in the trench and then the Lucens correlated all with what's happening? Uh, what's gone down the trench here, um, what went down the trench a short while before, a few million years earlier than 80, um, is a spreading ridge. And, and it's thought that these first seamounts here, the, the oldest ones in the Emperor chain, were produced at a spreading ridge. There's some geochemical evidence for that because it's all disappeared down the trench, so nobody knows. If there was a large igneous province there, a huge flood basalt, um, that might have been a plume head, then you would have expected that, you would expect that to have been scraped off and, and not to have been subducted. But the, the plate would have gone down and the, the, the flood basalt would have scraped off and been accreted onto the arc. Well, there's no evidence for that. So um, really, that's all we know. We, we, we think these older sea mounts formed in a ridge. <coughs> so there seem to be a lot of tantalizing things. Um, I mean, you know, it seems like an awful coincidence that this thing disappears down this cusp here, doesn't it? And um, if we look at the entire Pacific plate, Hawaii is at the very, very center. It's not some random place, it's in the center. But it looks like a big clue. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> In fact, um, if, if you want to have a laugh, um, you can uh, go to the website. I'll show you my, my very favorite um, web page. Um, let me see, it's on uh, Hawaii. And it's uh, written by uh, <laughs> <laughs> This is really funny. He starts off by saying, um, uh, The Hawaiian hotspot reminds me of an old Saturday Night Live skit. Quote <laughs> Steve Martin, What the hell is that? <laughs> if you click on here, you'll come to this skit where you know, they've hidden a camera and somebody's saying, What the hell is that? And his companion says, I don't know, John, what the hell is that? I don't know, what the hell is that? <laughs> this, is, this is where we are in Hawaii, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, um, earlier uh, talk we had about Hawaii was that there were two clubs fairly close to each other. Well, which speaker was that? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Someone back here? It was from, she was from uh, Study Hawaii in particular. But at any rate, it was they were really close together, so but it had to do with two and, right. so you well, there you are, you see, I mean if, if you if you take some more geochemical measurements and then things don't quite fit, you propose three or four. <laughs> just whatever you want. Yeah, she needs it's got to be testable. If you propose something, it's got to be testable or else it's not science. Yeah. You referred to the 
the volcanism has come up because of rifting, right? Is that correct? In a, in a plate of I'm, I'm saying that um, rifting tears the lithosphere apart. And just, just as if you took a big uh, cherry pie and you ripped the crust apart, the, the juice would pour out onto the top. OK, so I think rather than the other way, which is the volcanism is the cause of the rifting, what is the cause of the rifting? Well, the cause of the rifting, the, the plates are not um, completely rigid internally. So we have subduction zones, and every so often the plate boundaries will um, rejig themselves. For example, as I'll be um, mentioning tomorrow, um, recently um, a spreading plate boundary has been subducted down the west coast of uh, North America, and that's when the San Andreas Fault <coughs> started to fall. So these things are happening all the time where plate boundaries are not completely stable. Every so often they'll reconfigure themselves. And at that time, all the plates on, on the spherical Earth have to realign themselves. Some of them will split up, some of them will start compressing. And we know that there is internal deformation in the plates. And, and you know, it's a result of what's going on at the boundaries and the reconfiguration of the boundaries from time to time. So for example, on the East African Rift Valley, this is thought to be a nascent plate boundary and that people have actually calculated what plate tectonics will look like in 100 million years and evidently the uh, east coast of Africa is going to split off and the, the uh, East African Rift is going to become a spreading center. And uh, some people say that California is going to split off uh, North America and it's going to so north and Californians will lose all their beautiful weather because they'll end up somewhere near Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed at how quiet you are as an audience. <laughs> and I suspect, yeah, well, I suspect you have this kind of feeling of uncomfortableness. You know, we haven't answered, you know, Normally, John and I can get up here. And this is the way it is. Just ask us. We're geologists. We have taken you. That's you, John. That's not <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't even in Scotland. <laughs> we, we have essentially taken you right to the edge of understanding. And in fact, a little beyond where we're standing on a series of hypotheses and testing and quite frankly the tools to measure and see and answer which hypothesis is exactly right or give you that image that aha this is it we're not there yet so if you're feeling a little uncomfortable right now it's because you're right on that uncertainty we think it's this way but we can't show you anything that says absolutely it's that.